and I'm happy to present our next event, Mountains Connect uh, Partnerships Across Mountain Ranges. Um, so please welcome Udaya and Misra from Isimod um, to the stage. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here in the Crasper Pavilion again with all of our partners. And thank you, Arthi, for introducing this uh, session. So uh, this session would be something similar to what, uh, uh, you know, the, the previous session that we had in a way that it is also part of the, uh, the organization being done by the part of the Arab Senate Altitude Consortium, but along with other, uh, other organizations as well, including UNEP, uh, uh, Arab Senate Altitude, uh, <coughs> Carpathian Conventions, uh, uh, Eastern Africa, uh, African Community, and Alpine Convention as well. So uh, we all know that uh, <laughs> the fly is buzzing. Yeah, so uh, I'll try to be very quick. Uh, the world's mountain regions are facing similar challenges in terms of accelerated uh, climate change impacts. And there's a need to shift the understanding uh, of mountain realities from the periphery towards the center of global climate and environmental discourse. And that is uh, what uh, we came to uh, crash paper Pavilion this time at COP27 with a message, uh, with the slogan, moving mountains. So moving the mountain realities, you know, from the periphery to the center of the discussion. So just to give you a brief background of, you know, how this event uh, uh, was structured. So in June uh, this year, uh, the mountains uh, connect into regional workshop uh, you know, engage representatives from Alps, Andes, uh, South Caucasus, Carpathians, East Africa, and Hindukus Himalaya to connect and exchange knowledge on climate change, adaptation, and regional governance in the mountain regions. Uh, the workshop was undertaken as a part of the STC-funded Adaptation at Altitude program and with the support from the University of Geneva hosted by UNEP in Vienna, Austria. So building on the, uh, the Mountains Connect workshop that took place this year, uh, with this event, we aim to uh, share some of the lessons uh, that we've learned throughout that process uh, in our aim to understanding the mountain governance of different regions uh, across the world. And uh, as a part of the project, we've also come up with a, a setup of a, a knowledge portal, which, which we call Mountains Connect. So a part of the, the, the activity here is also to promote that, uh, uh, the online portal. Uh, so without further ado, what I'll do is uh, uh, I talked about the uh, June 2022 uh, 20 uh, interregional workshop, the Mountains Connect workshop. So I'll just request my friend to play the you know, very short video that will give us a glimpse of you know, what was that uh, uh, workshop about and what kind of discussion that we had around uh, regional uh, cooperation around the mountains. So may I request my colleague to uh, play the video? This workshop is definitely important. Mountains connect. Uh, it's important that uh, different mountain regions of this world uh, connect each other, exchange their experiences. From the Andes, from Africa, from Kathmandu, and, and of course the Alpine Convention. Uh, I came from the Carpathian region. Uh, we have uh, Carpathian Convention as a regional instrument for joint cooperation and uh, we are ready to share our, our experience. Uh, I'm ready to listen uh, and discuss uh, with my colleagues. Most of the mountains that we have in the East African community are transboundary, the same as the other regions in the world. We are very interested in learning more about the Alpine convention because we hope to benchmark from them to be able to also develop a regional framework for the East African community mountains development. I want to learn uh, all the good experience trying to apply governance in, in, in mountain areas, but also the problems and main challenge. <laughs> It's, it's, it's 
it in work that we look at. So responsibility for coordination should be there. Yeah, yeah, there's a responsibility for coordination, but okay. including Come on to the last things time. that everybody benefits from mm -hmm. where they are. Yeah. I think they tried to make everyone. Yeah. The mountains actually can uh, face the similar challenges, but different uh, regions uh, have different approaches and different experience how to handle those problems. And uh, we were talking uh, about uh, how can we connect to other regions. I believe that probably other regions can learn from us, especially on the involvement of the communities in sustainable mountain development. So there are 10, there are two. There are strong lessons on negotiations and strong lessons on win-win situation. In fact, the simulation mirrors the real-life situation in the mountains. And, uh, and, and for the future, I must first of all compliment the team uh, you know, constructed the simulation. <laughs> And that is then the next step is the global level. It was very interesting. I learned many things. Investing in uh, adaptation in mountain areas is expensive, and you must make a deliberate effort as a country or as a region to um, budget for adaptation. But also, we must have a balance between conservation and development. For me, it's really interesting this relationship between economical, legality, and political decisions. I, I learned a lot about that. But uh, we know that in reality, everything is more complex than, than that. So it's, it's an exercise. This workshop uh, as a platform also gives us opportunity uh, for networking. To, to put a face to the names of the people that I've been having meetings with online. It's very important to know the people and know all the conventions related with the mountains. I know now which person contact to ask the, the, the key questions that I, I, I have. One of the most interesting things about this um, workshop has been learning by seeing, learning by doing. We always um, talk about mountains being the water towers, in theory. But I practically saw that the mountains of Vienna are actually the source of water for Vienna. And I must say that water ideally must not have a taste, but that is the sweetest water I've tasted in my life. And I could not have enough of it. Thank you, colleagues. So there was a very quick uh, sort of uh, intro to the, uh, uh, the workshop that we had in Austria in June 22nd, which uh, dealt with understanding you know, different models of mountain governance uh, across the mountain regions in the world. Uh, but with this, uh, I just wanted to also acknowledge the presence of uh, His Excellency Mr. Susil Kumar Lamsal, uh, Ambassador of Nepal to Egypt, to this program. Thank you, sir, uh, for joining us uh, here with us. And we also have uh, 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 Mr. Helmut Hozeski, Chair of the Alpine Climate Board of the Alpine Convention, Austria. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have Alenka Smirkold, Secretary General from the Alpine Convention as well. Uh, we have Babar Khan, Senior Ecosystem Specialist from EC Mode. Dr. Arun Bhaktasvesta, uh, Senior Regional Program Manager from EC Mode. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Esika Fosenka, from the Antin Mountain Initiative, uh, Ministry of the Foreign Affairs from Peru, Latin America. So this, uh, this event actually is trying to bring in people, you know, and the uh, representatives from the different mountain regions across the world. Though ECMOR uh, being an organization working mostly in the eight uh, regional member countries, 
we wanted uh, to have this opportunity to opportunity to learn from other mountain regions mostly on the uh, the mountain governance structure and uh, i i should not also uh, forget to mention that uh, uh, the planning of this event uh, had been made successful with our colleagues from unep uh, who has joined us who has actually joined us virtually in zoom they are listening to us so we have uh, ansgar from unep and sabine and i think uh, mathias also has also joined and we also have harald agrar uh, 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 sorry not harald mathias joining from unep uh so uh, to take this event forward uh, i'd like to request uh, to just you know give a very few remarks i mean just two to three minutes on uh, on the you know the examples of mountain governance uh, from from the respective regions so for that uh, may i invite uh, alan kasmokols uh, secretary general alpine convention and uh, uh, while uh, she comes here can i request uh, my colleague ansu to share the slide Thank you very much, Dayan. Dear all, I am very, very grateful to ISIMOT for hosting again a side event dedicated to specificity of mountains, mountainous regions in uh, the climate crisis, which is always an issue and a topic for the Alpine Convention. Last year, I could only attend remotely, so therefore I'm even more happy to be uh, here today in order to exchange further. Um, the International Year of Sustainable Mountain Development provides us, I think, with really a unique scene, a unique opportunity to put the spotlight on mountain uh, regions, on our vulnerabilities and also on our specific solutions. And of course, this is also fitting in the end with the Mountains Connect workshop that took place in Vienna in June this year. And I was very happy to, to, to follow the video and understand a bit more. Um, my deputy was there and he came back enthusiastic of how knowledgeable colleagues, people from all around the world, from different mountainous regions are and how much we can learn from each other and I think this is also the main topic of uh, today's discussion. Um, we were also very very happy that after this workshop in Vienna we had a study visit in Innsbruck um, from Hindu Kush Himalayan High Level Test Task Force. It was led by, by ISIMOT um, and we spent basically two and a half days together uh, exchanging. Um, we tried to deliver our um, main uh, strengths, but also mistakes that we did. Uh, and we also learned from, from them. So they helped us reflect on our own processes in the Alps. For those of you who don't know Alpine Convention, uh, well yet. I wish just to briefly set the scene. Uh, on it's it's um, a regional collaboration within the Alps. We are a territory shared by eight countries like Hindu Kush Himalaya with, our, with four national languages and also almost 15 million people in the mountain area and even more, more than 80 million if you include the foothills. The first idea of the treaty dedicated to joint protection uh, and sustainable development of the Alps was part of the founding principles of the International Commission for the Protection of the Alps, CIPRA, an NGO created in 1952, so 70 years ago, already back then in reaction to the threats that the Alpine environment faced. And it took four decades, 40 years, to mature, the idea to mature, and then when it gained also support of the European Parliament and ultimately Germany offered, um, let's say, or organized the first ministerial meeting, which uh, it, this took place in 1989. And 
two years after, um, in 1991, the framework convention, the framework agreement among the eight countries and the European Union was signed. And since the beginning, the civil society, the NGOs, but also uh, very, I would say, specialized bodies like protected areas, is are, let's say, our um, natural habitat. It's something that remains paramount in our processes. We have a framework convention between the eight states and the European Union, and they are accompanied by eight thematic protocols. So it's quite uh, a, a heavy structure, uh, but which can produce also uh, results. And of course, as far as climate change is concerned, we do not have a protocol, but adaptation and mitigation um, throughout, basically, um, have been the priority area of our work for a very long time. We have designed uh, a plan and uh, we have designed concrete pathways. We have designed uh, also concrete measures. Uh, and this is what already um, Helmut Hueski, the chair of the Alpine board, mentioned in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, panel, but also he will afterwards, so I will not go very deep into it. It's now all about implementation. It's pretty, I cannot say easy, because it took us quite some time to design all the plans, to design the measures. But implementation is always a different thing, and it's never, it's never easy. So the, you have to involve a lot of different stakeholders. Uh, you have to involve uh, also very, very much all territorial levels, going down to communities. And it's a lot of communication. Uh, so the task of the Alpine Climate Board, uh, which Helmut chairs, is not an easy is not an easy task, and um, it's uh, actually quite a huge challenge. And we expect from the Alpine Climate Board a lot all the time. Um, so yeah, you can ask a lot of questions to to, to Helmut uh, afterwards. Uh, during this mandate, uh, the the work will focus mainly to reinforce the synergies between different sectors, which again, <laughs> easy to say, hard to do, uh, but also to address some conflicts that are arising, for instance, between renewable energy production and ecosystems preservation. Um, in conclusion, I would like to go back to where I started. Uh, it's about sharing experience and building partnerships. I think it's somehow also our responsibility to, to try and a bit force more collaboration among different mountain regions. Uh, we learned, especially this year, yes, we have the year, we have the scene, we have the potential, and we all, all also were able to gather some money from the contracting parties because we have the year of the international uh, sustainable in, uh, mountain development. But I think that it's the last, I mean, it's now the time when we need to move forward together. We are in different continents, but we have, we are, we are not, I mean, we have very, very similar challenges, even though we are very different. And I think we can really uh, sharing more and building partnerships is what we need to do now. So I'm very eager to hear what's going on elsewhere. And I think that there was one good things uh, during one good thing during the pandemics, and that is that we can now also exchange if we know each other. Uh, also, not just uh, when we work together, but online. But of course, this contact, and that's the reason why I'm happy to be here is crucial to, to then have all the potential for 
uh, everything or building partnerships also as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elenka, for uh, setting the scene and sharing some experiences of, uh, of the work of the Alpine Convention. And uh, as you said, it has truly been an honor to learn from the, uh, the mechanisms and the history of the convention for ECMOD, as ECMOD is in the process of sort of, uh, you know, proposing a similar mechanism in this region as well. So now just to touch, touch briefly on what ECMOD has been uh, doing so far from the learnings and from, uh, you know, all the, uh, the, the, the mechanism that we've established with the high-level task force with eight uh, representatives from the region. So I'd like to request uh, Dr. Bawar Khan uh, senior ecosystem management specialist from EC Mode, to briefly touch upon uh, what has been the progress so far uh, on that uh, prospect uh, from EC Mode's uh, perspective. And uh, Dr. Baba, you can also request my colleagues to uh, share the slide uh, that we have. Thank you so much, uh, Udain. <coughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Mom, good afternoon, although you must be tired attending all the day sessions. So let me briefly uh, tell you about uh, what ECMOD is trying to do in the HKH uh, region. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our partners from uh, uh, our partners from uh, Mountain Partnership uh, under the umbrella, umbrella of uh, adaptation at Altitudes program, uh, where we had the chance to meet some of uh, the regional networks, regional mountain networks working around the uh, globe. Uh, that was indeed a, a great learning experience and a wonderful opportunity to take some of our representatives uh, from the regional member countries in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region to the Mountains Connect workshop where they uh, listen to uh, our partners from the Alpine Convention, Arctic Council, and the Carpathian Council, how these regional mountain governance institutions or mechanisms are working. What's their organizational structure? How they perform their duties and responsibilities and deliver uh, on the objectives they have set for themselves. As uh, guided by uh, the ministerial declaration of October 22, uh, we had established a high-level task force for the HKH region. And these high-level task force uh, members are actually the government officials, senior government officials from all the eight HKH countries uh, who were then uh, agreed to uh, deliver on these uh, four things. There are a couple of other things as well, but these are very much relevant to this uh, forum. One was that we should have a ministerial mountain summit uh, every two years as, as, a, as a platform given to the political leadership public representatives of all the eight countries to come together, sit together, discuss the issues of their common interest and concern and benefits, obviously, and come up with an agenda to work together, to take collective actions, including climate change, but sustainable development and, and biodiversity conservation as well. Then the other uh, thing that was agreed in the declaration was we alone as individual countries in the region cannot really influence the global discourse on mountains. So we need to join hands with forces from the other regions as well. Apart from collaborating among ourselves within the region, we need to work closely with the other regional mountain organizations like Alpine Convention, Arctic Council, Carpathians, Andes, and many others uh, who are already doing a lot of work on that. So we could have a strong united voice on mountains to be discussed on the forums like this we are gathering here today. 
the third point was one of the gaps which uh, we have been discussing in our region in particular but i hope it's it's i, I can understand it's the similar you know sort of varying intensity and levels persist in other regions as well is the is the disconnect between the science and and the policy actually we we will go one step further saying that there's a disconnect between science policy and the practice that we want to deliver upon so therefore this task force was assigned a special task to convene biannually a science policy forum and that can start with the science policy dialogue at the country level of the hkh region where we have eight countries those science policy dialogues can then feed into this science policy forum which will be at the regional level where the countries can together discuss and identify the regional issues to work together and the fourth and most interesting was the high level task force had to conduct a feasibility study had to conduct a study of such institutional mechanisms from other parts of the world and as part of that institutional mechanisms they have to come up with a configuration that can suit that can be feasible that can be acceptable to the regional member countries in the hkh country so our high level task force members in that way attended the mountain connect workshop in vienna uh, this year in june where they were briefed about the existing mechanisms particularly from alpine convention arctic council and carpathian council i'm really feeling pleasure sharing with you that based on that experience that learning from that particular workshop the task force members agreed on a high level institutional mechanism for the hkh region they developed initially an outline to compile they to 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 just consolidate their learnings and experiences from this workshop and present it in the form of a report present it in the form of a report to the upcoming ministerial mountain summit we are planning to have the second ministerial summit in may next year and quite hopeful that the recommendation report that the members of high level task force with the support of isimodi simodi is actually the secretariat for uh, the high level task force they will finalize the report and present it to the uh, ministerial summit and if agreed in the summit then the ministers of the hkh countries will uh, issue a second declaration on formation of this high level institutional mechanism so thank you so much alpine convention arctic convention arctic council and carpathian conventions for giving us this opportunity to learn from your experiences your work structures governance mechanism to help us develop a smaller mechanism of mountain governance for the hkh countries we are on the way so hopefully we'll update you next year thank you so much Uh, thank you uh, bawarzi for sharing the progress that uh, isimod along with our sks countries has been making you know learning from the experiences from the other mountain regions so without further ado i think you know uh, in in all of this process and also uh, uh, the organization of the mountains connect workshop so it was very uh, nicely organized by unep austria team and uh, with honor i'd like to request my colleague uh, sabin uh, mac callum Uh, who is the associate program manager management officer at unep austria to deliver his uh, sort of you know brief remarks uh, which will be done online through zoom so ansu can i request uh, sabin to uh, say her remarks Hi Sabin do you hear us I can hear you I hope uh, this is was my sound working Yeah can you raise the volume a little bit up Yes Sabin I think we Hello. can hear you now yeah Perfect Good afternoon everyone and 
warm greetings from Austria. Um, my name is Ina McCallum. Um, it's a very young, um, uh, introduced me already, working on climate change in mountains at the UNEP's Vienna program office, and it's a true pleasure to be virtually joining this event, unfortunately not in person this time around. You already got a taste with the video from our Mountains Connect workshop, and it was actually a premiere today um, to show this video. And many thanks also to our colleagues from Zoe um, in producing this documentation. Um, that is, and I hope this conveys the message of being extremely inspiring and and uh, and also a lot of good takeaways uh, that it produced. Uh, it always puts a bright smile on my face, seeing and hearing also what uh, colleagues from Hindu Kesha Malayas and also from the Alps and other mountain region that we featured and invited to this workshop um, to see how inspiring this interregional exchange um, and this uh, mutual learning from each other um, can, can be and will further be supported under the Adaptation at Altitude program, um, which is financed by the Swiss Development Corporation. UNEP, um, uh, apart from our regional work in East Africa and the South Caucasus, is tasked to foster this interregional exchange further. Um, and uh, we are pleased that this side event uh, being co-organized um, together with ECMOD is another stepping stone towards strengthening our joint efforts in facilitating mountain governance um, mechanisms, and ultimately, of course, most needed climate action in mountain areas. So uh, why interregional exchange? Um, a lot has been said already, um, although um, all mountain regions, of course, have specific, are specific in terms of the natural surroundings, but also their socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. When it comes to climate change, aggravating already existing development challenges we are all sharing very similar concerns. And these concerns do obviously not stop at national borders, um, which is why regional governance is so important, especially for connecting ecosystems such as mountains. The Mountains Connect virtual space, which has been mentioned um, on the website mountains-connect.org, has been collecting various approaches uh, for governance mechanisms of eight um, mountain regions across the world. Together with the University of Geneva, we have been producing short videos um, on most relevant governance dimensions, which I can only warmly recommend to watch. Um, they're about six to eight minutes, um, very easy to digest and uh, should certainly be another background material uh, to inspire uh, and learn from, from the various approaches that are featured in those um, videos um, and uh, providing insights from mountain stakeholders, um, which, um, which uh, actually talk about their experiences uh, and share their knowledge. Um, various approaches are chosen um, in the different mountain regions, um, which are deemed to be effective in terms of facilitating climate action. Um, one should be stressing that um, each mountain region um, has, of course, chosen approaches um, due to the setting um, made politically, the political space um, that are working in may it uh, be social uh, and cultural um, backgrounds. And I think all of them are extremely interesting. Um, that's why this exchange and learning is so important um, because every single component of approaches and aspects can be useful also in other regions. Um, we strongly believe that this learning uh, from these approaches and supporting each other in further strengthening or building up regional structures will inspire ease and most importantly, speed up related processes as frameworks for safeguarding our beautiful mountains and their crucial ecosystem services. I always uh, love the end of the video when Maureen, our dear colleague from Uganda, is talking about the sweet water of Vienna coming from the close uh, Vienna mountains. That's exactly one of the ecosystem services that are mostly important to um, preserve. I stop here um, and look much forward to hear more from the panel about the backgrounds and experiences in their mountain world. 
And thank you so much for being able to virtually join this event. Back to you, Udayan. All right. Uh, thank you, Savin, uh, for, for sharing your remark uh, from the UNIS perspective. I think uh, the interregional workshop that you all organized uh, uh, this June, uh, this year, was, was truly uh, instrumental for all of the mountain regions, communities to ex exactly you know, learn, learn from the different experiences uh, from the, uh, of, the, of the regional mechanism. So uh, thank you very much for your quick remarks. So now uh, we move into the next... Uh, uh, next part of the session today where uh, we'll have a sort of a moderated dialogue with uh, some of the representatives here from different mountain re uh, regions. So uh, to uh, carry out the moderated dialogue, may I request uh, Dr. Babur Khan from EC Mode uh, to the stage and invite our respected guests uh, to be in the panel uh, at, the, at the front. Thank you. Thank you, Udayan. Thank you so much. Uh, as Udayan and other distinguished speakers have already mentioned, that this particular session is about cross learning and exchange of information. And uh, this particular uh, panel talk is more about two types of cooperation leading to collaborative actions. One is uh, how the institutions have been promoting regional cooperation uh, among the countries at, at their own regional level, within their own region. Uh, we wish to really listen to you, how you have been uh, bringing different countries within your region to cooperate with each other for the promotion of a sustainable development mountain agenda and improved governance, say, in the Alpine region, in, in Arctic region or in some other mountainous region. Uh, and then what type of challenges did you experience and what strategies you adopted to resolve them? Because we expect that these type of challenges and issues will be coming up uh, and we will be facing them in the HKH region, trying to bring our partners to work together. And my second question uh, would be, how we can better cooperate with each other is like more like inter-regional cooperation. How the Andes, how the Alps, how the HKH, how the Arctic can work together to become a really strong and influencing voice of the mountain communities at the global forums. So before going into uh, having your remarks, May I request my esteemed panelists to join us here in front? Uh, I would like to invite Harold. She's joining us online. Okay. So, Harold Agar, could you please show her on the screen? Harold Igrad is Secretary General, Carpathian Convention. Welcome, Harold. Thank you for joining us. My second guest speaker is Jessica Fonseca. Would you please, ma'am, join us here? Thank you so much. And I would also like to request Helmut Hojiski, Chair of the Alpine Climate Board of the Alpine Convention, Austria, too. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Arun Sirista, may I request you to please represent T.C. Mode in the panel. Dr. Arun Sirista, as you have heard in the previous session, is the lead and expert on cryosphere and river basins working at T.C. Mode. We have the honor to have with us His Excellency Sushil Kumar Lamsar, 
Honorable Ambassador of Nepal to Egypt here with us. Uh, we would really like to chair this session by you, sir. And at the end, you will uh, guide us by giving some closing remarks. And is he more being a host country? Uh, Nepal being a host country of uh, the uh, easy mode uh, office. So that's why we would also request honorable ministers to say a few words to pay a word of thanks to our esteemed guests here. So without taking much of your time, let me put the question first. to Jessica Fonseca. May I ask the question to you, please? And the question is, what model of cooperation mechanism, council, convention, or some others work best in your region to bring mountain voices together and follow up to that, what are the challenges and lessons you learned from your previous work? So I will be putting the same question to all the three panelists, and they'll come to the Honorable Secretary at the end, uh, Honorable Ambassador at the end for some conclusions. So over to you, Well, uh, it's okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I am honored to be here in first place with such experts on their field, so it, it is um, uh, very, yeah, a very happy occasion. Uh, the Andean Mountain Initiative is a non-binding uh, mechanism that brings together seven of the Andean countries in the South America region. And uh, we, we are now working on strengthening this uh, mechanism of cooperation um, as I said, it's a non binding agreement. So uh, we share the same goal of develop a um, more sustainable um, approach to the Andean management of the, of the, Andean, on, of the Andean region. And we are working uh, together to, to achieve this, this goal. As you said before, uh, and also in, in the presentation about about uh, the region, there is um, a lot a lot of work to do uh, with the regional and sub regional levels in our countries. There is a, a big challenge there, and we have to work with a lot of different stakeholders. We have to work with the rural communities, with the indigenous people, with women with the urban communities also in the in the mountains and it has been a challenge for us to to find the best way the best approach to to implement that's uh, also one of the challenges we have we have the policies and now we need to implement them and the implementation is uh, the most difficult part for us and the implementation in the sub national level that's the key part that we need to work uh, now on, as you said, uh, the sh the science is on, on one level, the policies on another one, and yes. implementation, uh, yeah, lags behind. On a different level. Yes, exactly, on different level, and and it is the same for us. We we need to work uh, on that level, and that's why we are glad to have the opportunity to share these experiences and to hear how you are working in your regions to to address the same challenges that we have. Um, that, that's, that's. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. May I put the same question to you, sir? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, well, in the Alpine region, we have the privilege uh, that we have a convention as a basis for collaboration, as Alenka has pointed out, since uh, 1991 already. We have eight protocols we are working on. So that's, uh, that's our legal framework. Uh, however, we uh, we have these formal meetings of uh, of parties of ministers every two years, where decisions are taken, 
but uh, collaboration within the Alpine Convention is much more, of course. Uh, we are working closely together with our observers, Zebra uh, was mentioned, um, and, and many others within the Alpine region. But uh, as also pointed out uh, during the previous uh, side event, and sorry for, I hope you don't have any overdose of uh, as I pointed out, uh, the, the uh, Alpine Climate Board uh, is also working closely with other mountainous regions uh, uh, like the HKH, like the Andes, uh, the Caucasus and the Carpathians. Uh, so this is key, this is important. Uh, there are challenges, of course. Uh, the challenges are that uh, our parties have different political uh, legal circumstances. Some are federal countries, uh, so we have, in the case of Austria, for instance, but also Germany, we have uh, the federal level, we have uh, then the regional, provincial level, and we have the local level. And all three levels have uh, their own uh, jurisdiction. Uh, mm -hmm. So to bring this together is complicated, uh, but the Alpine Convention is the umbrella, and, and we try to, to share our, our challenges as well. And, and bring together uh, people uh, and uh, also the local and, uh, and regional level. So, for instance, we have representatives of the province of the Tyrol and Bavaria in the Alpine Climate Board, so they represent the regional level. So it's uh, a, a good way of, of understanding each other much better. That's so great. that's our, our way, how we proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really uh, interesting to learn about the, the Alpine conventions, work, the challenges you faced. And obviously, I will come to the other question as how you were able to manage this. Let me now go to my colleague, Arun Bakhto Shrista. Although we know that Hindu Kush Himalaya is comparatively uh, a more challenging uh, region in terms of the countries they share resources. Uh, particularly where the water resources are transboundary and, and biodiversity in some cases. But at the same time, there are tremendous benefits being shared by different countries and which flow across the borders of their, their countries and go beyond the national borders. So ECMOD has been struggling for the last almost three decades, more than three decades now, to bring the countries in the region to work together. Dr. Arun, what do you think that what strengths we have uh, what are the opportunities in the region and obviously the challenges to, to bring all the countries, eight countries, onto the table and make them discuss the, the issues and the benefits they have as common agenda to work on? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, you have rightly started the statement by saying there are challenges. So I probably will start from challenges because, because we have plenty. Uh, there are also opportunities, uh, also plenty. But uh, moving from uh, challenge to harnessing the opportunities, I think we need to fathom quite a bit of depth. So I would start by, you know, kind of uh, talking about the challenges, right, to set the context. I have been introduced uh, as a manager, regional program manager for Cryospair and uh, uh, river basins and Cryospair. Um, so that means I work in the water sector mostly. And uh, I guess uh, we all know in Hindu Kush Himalaya, water is considered very, very sensitive issue. Uh, not only the quantum of water, but also uh, the bad part of water, DRR, even, you know, cooperation around is taken with high sensitivity. So what I personally call uh, this uh, is part of, a, you know, a vicious circle of mistrust. Uh, let me try to explain it, if I may. You know, water being a very sensitive area, particularly it is also, uh, you know, supporting the geopolitical sensitivity uh, in the region, right? So the geopolitical sensitivity, actually what it does, it uh, inhibits many different things. Uh, 
uh, it inhibits cooperation, but it inhibits also uh, science cooperation. So because of geopolitical sensitivity, this cooperation around science is also at a very low level. Now what it does, uh, if you do not have science cooperation in a shared, uh, you know, uh, geography like a river basin, uh, you have incomplete knowledge uh, and also siloed knowledge, right? Uh, so what happens in, the, in our region is there are a lot of myths. There are a lot of myths around what is happening in upstream country and how it will impact downstream country. There are myths, uh, sometimes very, very uh, surprising myths uh, being put in the press about why the glaciers are melting and probably the military actions were responsible for the glacier melting. That kind of things are quoted. You know, uh, this kind of myths actually are emanating from incomplete knowledge of the system where only compartmentalized research work happened, right? And then that kind of myths actually uh, feeds back to the geopolitical sensitivity. So that vicious circle of geopolitical sensitivity goes on and on. And we think to make any, you know, dent on it, you really have to break that circle. Mm, uh, and the only way at present state in Hindu Kush Himalaya is through knowledge, right? Uh, and knowledge cooperation is something which we really have to put, you know, emphasis on. Uh, and on the longer run, this will actually uh, reduce the mistrust, the myths, and then uh, result in more, you know, stronger cooperation at political level, right? So that's what we have been working on. So at least from uh, my groups, my personal experience, we have been working on uh, basin level knowledge platforms and knowledge hubs, knowledge networks. We have a few examples. For example, in Indus Basin, we have Upper Indus Basin uh, Network, which brings together, uh, it's a semi-formal uh, arrangement. You know, there are... Uh, there are government representatives, but also non-government academic representatives as, as uh, members of the network. Uh, but it is a voluntary kind of network where uh, representatives from four industry basin riparian countries come together and talk about uh, research related to climate, cryosphere, water, disaster and adaptation, right? So this has been going quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, although you know the countries uh, sharing that river basin have big political issues. Um, the other example is around Koshi Basin, which is part of uh, Ganges, uh, shared by China, Nepal and India. We have Koshi DRR Knowledge Hub, also taken with quite interest by all three countries. Uh, so these are some of the examples which we have been uh, following uh, and believe that through knowledge, uh, in the longer run, it will take time, it will take a uh, lot of patience, um, but uh, this is the way to reach to a more stronger collaboration yeah, in, in those you. river basins. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Arun. Yeah, it's one of the ways to depend on non-political forums at some time to discuss the political agenda at a later stage. Knowledge of starting with the knowledge and information exchange and sharing in case of Hindu Kush Himalaya has been uh, quite useful. Uh, I would like to know from you uh, again, what opportunities uh, do you see uh, for inter-regional cooperation, like cooperation between Hindu Kush Himalaya, Andes, Caucasus, Alpine and Arctic uh, regions for exchange of such knowledge which is useful and can be common to all others and they can use it uh, as we use it in case of our uh, institutional mechanism uh, so if we, if we just stay ourselves to the climate change also and focus adaptation measures so could you share some some experiences that what type of opportunities do you you, you really see that can be helpful for promotion of inter-regional cooperation on adaptation to climate change. Please, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, as we saw in the video uh, at the beginning, there's a lot of interest in cooperation between regions. Um, 
we 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 share uh, similar challenges and not so similar also but but there is a willingness uh, to collaborate uh, one of the the issues uh, we think it will be important to get uh, cooperation is to support the development of processes uh, specific uh, policies to mountains glaciers that are specific to mountain glaciers and paramos and other mountain ecosystem and also we need uh, support for formulating and implementing adaptation measures to climate change in mountain ecosystems this is it's another topic that uh, and then countries are very interested yeah. in, in getting cooperation uh, and and also i will i will say the concepts of of articulation of harmonization and cooperation are key uh, in in this in this uh, work that we can do together and we we also want to know uh, how uh, in the case of the Alpian Convention, you have a convention. So how uh, has been the process of the negotiation to the convention to get, I mean, uh, I, I can imagine the, the hardness <laughs> of that process. And so that kind of, because we are thinking of the future and maybe the other, the other countries uh, evaluating the progress of our platform can reach a conclusion that we need a convention. So it will be really helpful for us to, to know this process and also the challenges that, that mean for our for your countries to have a convention and a legal binding instrument that is very different to, to an initiative that is non-binding. No? So uh, I, I would say that we, we, we find that there is a willingness in the international community to work together in this issue. Uh, yeah, it is very important, and we have a uh, key uh, uh, so, sources. I mean, I, I forgot the, the word in English, but associates uh, to partners, yeah. key partners uh, in the international organizations that are and the non-international organizations that are working th towards that goal. So I would say it's a very positive environment. Yeah. Uh, not without challenges, but I think it is uh, the moment to, to, to strengthen the work. Thank you so much. May I ask, uh, uh, Helmut, uh, may I know from you uh, how difficult it is to take financial resources for implementation of the mountain agenda in your region? And what opportunities do you really see for all of us in the different regions to work together and build on actually, you know, a concrete sort of argument for discussion at the forums like COP27 and future, future COPs? Yeah, thank you. These are, in fact, two questions, and I would like Absolutely. to separate them. Yes. The first uh, question is uh, how we, we handle uh, the cooperation, uh, in fact, without financing. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, in the Alpine Climate Board, we established so-called caretaker groups, uh, uh, so uh, people who uh, work on the implementation of the pathways of the specific sectors they are working on. And this is, uh, in our experience, uh, a bit difficult to motivate people because some have uh, the support from their uh, institutions or superiors, others uh, are lacking this. Uh, so. We, we are thinking about uh, how we can uh, bring them towards uh, financing which we as the board cannot provide. So our advice was please uh, look to the different uh, possibilities of uh, applying for projects within the country mm -hmm. uh, they live but also from the EU. There's a lot of uh, opportunities in different tracks and uh, some were already successful yeah. so they applied for projects which they implement and the results will be brought back uh, in the uh, interregional context uh, i think it's important uh, to to show uh, some willingness to to support specific uh, uh, projects uh, and uh, as i said in the previous side event uh, Austria is, is uh, spending one million for the mountains adapt uh, project of, of UNEP and others uh, because we think it's important that uh, 
pilot projects for certain adaptation uh, measures are implemented and we can learn from each other by implementing these projects. We have all the same concerns, uh, we have different national circumstances, but uh, we, we have the same problems like melting glaciers, like uh, uh, melting permafrost, uh, uh, rock falls, uh, avalanches, landslides, uh, these are all the same uh, in all our regions and we have to cope with them. Some will not be uh, possible to cope with because uh, with the permafrost uh, melting there yeah. is no way to adapt yeah. to it we have to uh, yeah to uh, to find uh, some sort of security measures yeah rather uh, there is some end of uh, of adaptation but as i said we can learn from each other uh, how we can best uh, counteract to all these uh, hazards which will increase in the future yeah yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I will go to, uh, before I ask uh, Arunji. Can, can I quickly uh, put the same question to you for a quick response, Arunji? Especially, what opportunities do you see in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region for an inter regional cooperation with other mountain networks from the globe? Right, thank you. Um, since, as, as mentioned earlier, the region is still as a, at a very, you know, early state when it comes to, uh, you know, cooperation around shared uh, space. Um, I think we have a lot, lot to learn. And again, going back to my own uh, area, which is around water, it is, uh, you know, managing basins, right? The river basins, large river basins. We talk about the services provided by those river basins, 1.9 billion people. But then uh, our, uh, in terms of managing it, we are quite behind. So we have ample opportunity to, to learn uh, how others have done it. Um, and, uh, you know, if we look at history, all of the river basins did not, you know, automatically start cooperating, right? Yeah. They, they always, always had issues. If you look at Rhine, Danube, you know, Nile River Basin, you know, all ha have and still have issues, but somehow they managed to, uh, you know, uh, something they managed uh, to realize that, you know, cooperation is, um, you know, definitely needed, you know, uh, Non-cooperation is only to, to, to the harm, right? You know, in, in many ways, including economic terms. Uh, and, and, and also Mekong in, in our region has a formal mechanism. So I think we have a lot of opportunity to learn uh, from others. And again, I go back to my own favorite topic, the knowledge, right? Which is a kind of breakthrough in, in all this. And what I see, uh, having... Proper understanding always has been a hurdle to cooperation in those river basins as well, as well as other global, uh, you know, uh, you know, cooperation frameworks like, uh, uh, let's say, in Arctic, for example. Uh, Arctic has a special working group, if I understand, uh, uh, called AMAP, right? Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program, which is kind of like a uh, group that uh, provides the scientific uh, basis, scientific information, which uh, provides uh, very strong feedback, uh, you know, for uh, cooperation. I think, so I, I, I think uh, at the moment, still the knowledge, uh, improving the knowledge is important. And I think we need to, uh, this kind of discussion platform where Arctic, Andes, Alpine, uh, you know, uh, conventions and frameworks are there and we are sharing the knowledge, what has been their, uh, you know, knowledge uh, in the past, how they have evolved from non-cooperation to cooperation. I think that's something which I think is the most valuable uh, thing that w we could get uh, from those regions. I yeah, think that's yeah, what I would yeah, say. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Agreed. Agreed, Arunjit. Knowledge diplomacy, since uh, yeah, diplomat is with us. So knowledge diplomacy can be one of the ways to take power. I'm sorry, uh, Harold, for putting you uh, on wait for a long time. Let me uh, come to you with two questions. My first question is, 
what mechanisms are working well in the Carpathian region? And second is what opportunities you really see or foresee uh, to develop inter-regional cooperation among different mountain networks around the world. I hope I was able to communicate the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I see that I'm somehow apart on the screen, so I didn't want to uh, interrupt. But thank you very much for the for the question. And again, uh, hello to everybody. Greetings from the Carpathian Convention. Uh, we are, so to say, the younger uh, sister or cousin of the Alpine Convention. Uh, born in 2003. Unit uniting the Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia, Serbia, Poland, Ukraine, and Romania in this kind of cooperation. And the message I wanted to pass is that for us, it's very important to have a formal arrangement. And uh, one can do many other things together, but to have this formal arrangement uh, for us is key and has made, made a big difference. And, uh, I also believe that the stronger this formal arrangement is, the better it is. So you can have some several stages of this formal cooperation. But once you have this formal and institutionalized cooperation, it will create many informal spin-offs, very informal forms of cooperation as well. So it's not exclusive, it's, 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 it's not either or, it's all together. Have a formal one and the informal arrangements are following and we have very active cooperation in the field of science. We generate a lot of joint common knowledge that we can share, but also a lot of joint projects uh, through that. Now, um, our challenges uh, is a little bit, the, um, of course, mountains are not the top priority usually in capitals and also a low capacity to deal with it. But um, our main challenge in the moment, for example, is that we have a major crisis in, uh, in, in Ukraine. We have war in one of our contracting states. Um, but with a formal arrangement, we are continuing this active cooperation at the Carpathian level in addressing the challenges for the Carpathians. So now for the interregional part, I think that um, we really believe that uh, uh, strengthening formal mountain region arrangements in all parts of the world uh, is key for interregional cooperation. We can work very well with Alpine Convention ECMOT and, uh, and also others. Um, the Carpathian Convention is also very lucky to be close to the United Nations Environment Program that is facilitating our secretariat. So this we can even have more power to facilitate cooperation and we can get a lot of inspiration from all the other mountain regions uh, in the Andes, in Africa, all over the world that we are working with. Um, and thank you for this video that was shown in the very beginning uh, from the UNEP, let's say, Interregional Mountain Program, as we might call it, and to Matthias Ansgar and Sabine who have presented that work. The opportunities for further cooperation is pretty clear for us as well. Uh, climate change is on the top as well. Mountains are most effective. Affected, sorry, um, coalitions like this very event that you are having here now is very important. And I would also like to emphasize the good cooperation that we have with the Alpine Convention and with the Alpine Climate Board of Mr. Hoyeski that we are now uh, basically uh, applying. And also uh, biodiversity in mountains is very important. We are now going to uh, resign an updated memorandum of cooperation between the Alpine Convention, the Carpathian Convention, and the Convention of Biological Diversity. We share our experiences with all the mountains of the world in framework of global biodiversity framework and pretty, pretty discussions. And lastly, also to say ecosystems restoration, because we are in the middle of the decade of ecosystem restoration, and there are a lot of opportunities in mountains. As part of such, for example, we have now um, um, uh, submitted a flagship, hopefully uh, advocating for mountain ecosystem restoration together uh, with uh, uh, Central Asia and Africa and uh, Serbia. So um, these interregional cooperation and projects for us are key. Thank yep. you. Yep, thank you. Thank you for sharing great ideas. Indeed, uh, climate change is 
one of the biggest opportunities being cross cutting affecting all the mountain regions and other areas in the world so that could be taken as an opportunity to work together at, at the uh, at the inter regional uh, levels uh, so this is time uh, to request you for uh, some uh, conclusions from the discussion before we uh, ask our unep colleagues to formally conclude the session uh, honorable ambassador of nepal to egypt sushil kumar thank you Salsa. thank you so much uh, mr khan uh, for this opportunity to summarize the discussions in the session so i think there have been a couple of uh, important consensus during these discussions the first is the need to build institutions and a legal framework to clarify the procedures and processes for cooperation and collaboration among mountain countries. So it was clear from the discussions that the three mountain regions that we discussed chiefly, the Hindukush, Mount, the Hindukush Himalaya mountain region, the Alpine community, the Alpine mountain regions, the Andes, I think they figure into three distinct and different kinds of uh, governance. And in this hierarchical, hierarchical um, uh, in this uh, setting, I would uh, suggest, I would think that the Alpine community is one of the most sophisticated, the most uh, robustly developed yet. And after that, the Andes community is learning from such experiences. But then, as Arunji pointed out, there is a great scope for further collaboration and community building in our region. Uh, I mean, in my region, uh, in the Hindukush Himalaya region. I think this is an important point. Unless we enhance mutual cooperation and build a framework for governance, the problems and challenges that we have seen will continue to accentuate. That was the, uh, that was the first important lesson or the, uh, or the most important point, I think, that these discussions uh, pointed out. To the second, also, is that the need for sharing scientific expertise was uh, was recognized. The the initiative to do something springs from a realization that there is a gap between reality and policy. So unless we understand the severity of the problem, for example, climate change itself, I'm sure that the sensitivity that climate change negotiations have earned over the past couple of decades would not have been possible without the best science backing behind such discussions. So, as Arunji said, again, yes, the need and necessity of sharing expertise and scientific knowledge is important. And how to do this is the most important challenge, I think, that uh, faces the different mountain communities. So, uh, to summarize the discussions, we heard from Alenka about the Alpine Convention, and about how the different eight countries have built into a harmonious cooperation mechanism through protocols. Uh, and of course, there is, not, uh, there is not yet a protocol and concrete measures for climate, man uh, climate adaptation. But then the principles that the Alpine community, the Alpine Convention has, uh, has uh, agreed on provides the basis to reconcile competing objectives in a predictable manner. So the initiative for collaboration among nation, nations, the eight, the eight countries in the community, and the willingness to share experience has built a synergy which is lacking in many other communities of mountain, mountainous countries. And so we also heard from uh, Dr. Khan about the initiative in the Himalayan, the Hindukush Himalaya region, 
and how the experiences of the Arctic Council, the Alpine Conventions, etc., have been helpful. I hope that the high-level task force that has been created after the first ministerial will be able to come up with recommendations based on the experiences and best practices of other communities so that the second ministerial, which is being held in the first half of 2023, will be able to put it up before the political leadership to at least come up and agree on a convention, at least in a semi-formal or at least in a non-binding way that the uh, Indian community has come up with, for example. That would be the first stage before coming to the other, uh, uh, the other phases. And we also heard from Sabine about the Mountain Connect, the initiative to encourage mutual learning about different uh, mountain uh, countries. And uh, uh, we also heard uh, about the importance of developing regional strategies and policies for adaptation to climate change based on inter-regional uh, cooperation and collaboration. So in the Indian community, the Indian mountain is a mountain community, we learned from Jessica that even though it's a non-binding agreement among the member states, it is a process for sustainable development of the mountain, the predictable environment of a policy dialogue uh, 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 ecosystem that facilitates cooperation on garnering the resources of scaling the best practices, not just in the region that the uh, mountain, those countries inhabit, but also from other parts of the world. Even though implementation is a key challenge, which is common to many other countries, as we have seen, I hope that the Indian mountain community will be able to improve the co collaborative uh, processes and come up with even better outcomes in the future. Uh, of, of, uh, the Alpine Regional Community was established in 1991. We heard from uh, Mr. Hagelmert and the eight protocols, it provides a legal force and the principles for enhancing cooperation and collaboration. Even though the political systems of different countries, some being federal countries, others not, has created kind of a challenge, which I think should also be one of the parameters, one of the considerations that the Hindu Koshimel and region might want to consider before developing the framework and uh, frameworks of legal cooperation. But then, uh, if, uh, if we start, I mean, the first step leads to other steps, and I'm sure integration and collaboration will continue to be enhanced. Arunji highlighted the vicious circle of mistrust in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, which has impacted other political uh, organizations as well. Political meaning regional cooperation, for example, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation has been a victim of similar, uh, 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 similar challenges. But then how to break this challenge is a key question. And the key to breaking this challenge would be to first start with scientific collaboration, because when we understand that we are in the perilous uh, situation of destruction, political cooperation will follow. So the key is better understanding, better sharing of knowledge and expertise. So there is a consensus uh, among speakers that the key to future collaboration is to learn from each other's best practices to develop uh, processes, procedures, governance mechanisms, institutions, and to garner resources, if not from a macro level, then at least from different perspectives, different partners and different sectors, as Hel Dr. Helmut pointed out, on specific sectors, if not on uh, a macro level, that will at least start a good practice, an island of excellence, which can be scaled up. And the private sector uh, would also be willing, I'm sure, to cooperate and uh, contribute to this process. So before uh, concluding, I'd like to take this opportunity to express sincere thanks to the organizers of this event. Uh, from ISIMOD, Mr. Udayan Mishra, Knowledge Management and Networking Officer, 
Dr. Babur Khan, Senior Ecosystem Specialist, Dr. Arun Vaktashrestha, Senior Climate Change Specialist, and Deepshika Sharma, Climate Environment Specialist. And uh, from the Alpine Convention, Ms. Alenka Smekolj, Secretary General, Sabine McCollum, Program Management Officer of United Nations Environment Program, who joined us uh, through video link, and Angsa Fellendorf, Climate Change Expert at UNEP, and Jessica Fonseca, who is here with us, the Andean Mountain Initiative at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Peru. Thank you for your very helpful, insightful comments, Jessica. Harold Aguera, Secretary General of Capetian Convention, who joined us through the video link. And last but not the least, Mr. Helmut Hojeski, Chair of the Alpine Climate Board of the Alpine Convention, which I'm uh, sure is one of the most uh, uh, forerunners of this uh, initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, would you like to say something, please? Sorry to take uh, one minute of your time, but uh, I would like to take the opportunity for a small advertisement. Uh, we talked about cooperation and communication is another essential element uh, in this context. And I uh, would like to present you our recent product from the Alpine Climate Board. It's a brochure um, where we uh, share um, good practice examples in, in four sectors. It's, it's how we move, uh, so commuting in the Alps, how we live, buildings, uh, what we eat and uh, what we buy, and finally, what we enjoy. So, leisure time. Uh, you find uh, examples, uh, good practice examples throughout the Alps in this brochure. I have brought with me uh, six copies. You will find them on the table. But it's also on our website, uh, alpineclimate2050.org. Uh, you can download it from the website of the Alpine Climate Board as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helmut. I hope this will be very useful for many of us because uh, this is the time to this is the time to uh, uh, reach to solutions for adaptation to climate risks and changes, and this will obviously be one of the solution guidelines for many of us to uh, to seek help from it. With this, our uh, panel discussion uh, comes to an end. I wish to thank you all. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Helmut. Thank you, Arunji. And thank you so much, sir, for sparing your time to be with us. Uh, it was indeed a uh, yeah, very useful and uh, enlightening discussion. I wish I could continue, but the time is not permitting us. So, Herald, thank you so much for being with us and waiting us uh, for a long time. Uh, now I will uh, move to the last segment of uh, uh, the session where I think uh, our colleague and friend Ansgar from UNEP is waiting online. Ansgar, would you come in and please uh, share some uh, views briefly about the whole session and also pay a vote of thanks to the participants. Ansgar. Um, in this virtual format, so thanks also to the technical team of the Chrysler Pavilion for facilitating this. Um, uh, the Excellency Ambassador um, of Nepal to Egypt, I think, summarized uh, very well what has been um, said on, on the subject. It was great to uh, hear from the Secretary General of the Alpine Convention the remark that sharing more and building partnerships is what we need to do more. And at UNEP, we are happy to support this interregional um, exchange uh, further. So this is just one step. Uh, this event is one step in the whole uh, process of interregional exchange and building partnerships. Um, we invite you to visit the www.mountains-connect.org, learn more, uh, watch the videos. Um, and yeah, we continue the work. And thank you to everyone for 
um, the successful event. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ansgar. Palandrop from UNDP for your closing remarks and thanks with this the events uh, we like to conclude. Thank you, speakers, panelists, participants for your wonderful contributions in joining us. Have a good time. Thank you.